All right, so we have a, a panel of folks coming up next. So first of all, thank you, Jonathan, very much. And um, uh, again, I think that's the, the, the consumption side is something very important to pay attention to. Uh, the, um, again, it goes to that sort of we have yet to see the, the, the ultimate model come into place because I think for a lot of organizations, um, I, I, I talk to organizations that, that ultimately uh, want to build the fabric and want to have that capability. They, they're, they're very rapidly architecting, creating, and integrating, and building a, a series of applications together. I speak to others that kind of see PASS being used a lot for experimentation and one-off development. And in those situations, I tend to see that public PASS has, uh, has a slightly better uptake as well. So um, it's, uh, there's a lot of opportunity, um, I think, for, for right now for people to experiment with business models to get uh, tools out there and, uh, and to try to see, uh, drive the enterprise in the right direction. But we have yet to see kind of how it works out. All right. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to uh, um, introduce uh, Ben Kepes, who's uh, a very prolific blogger in the cloud computing space, also a very strong, uh, strong independent analyst in the space. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let him introduce the rest of his panel. But the uh, panel discussion um, and I don't have the actual title in front of me, but uh, I'll let him introduce his panel, and uh, we'll have the uh, uh, follow-up discussion. Um, so a couple of quick announcements. Um, lunch is going to be from 105 to 205 uh, in, the, in the, that adjoining room. At 205, I will do the, uh, the complex uh, adaptive systems talk that I mentioned earlier this morning. Uh, so um, that will be a, 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 um, a from 2.05 to about 2.35, and then we'll pick up with the uh, agenda uh, as it was uh, laid out uh, up until now. So uh, with no further ado, let's get the panel up on stage. Thank you. Coming up, guys. So it only seems right to uh, follow Jonathan's fantastic uh, keynote, um, and his was in, uh, in a particularly uh, unusual accent to, to have another difficult accent or unusual accent coming up here. Uh, and we're, we're going to talk all about enterprise, so I thought I'd wear enterprise clothes for the day, um, start, starting off the way we want to continue. Wanted to do a little bit of scene setting, I guess, around this. Um, I'm really aware when when I first talked to Chris about this event that in this room we probably have a uh, hundred of the most passionate people in the world around uh, most passionate 120 people in the world around pass. So we're really preaching to the converted here. Everyone here believes um, to a greater or lesser extent that that pass is absolutely the future of cloud computing and the future of the enterprise. Um, and the risk in that is always that we'll all get kind of excited by our own echo chamber and, and really passionate about it and kind of forget what, forget what the use case is, forget what the value proposition is, forget what the economics are, and forget at the, at the end of the day what enterprises actually want from this. So I think it's really important that um, early, in, early on in the day we can kind of set the scene a little bit and, and, and talk about the enterprise expectations and the economic drivers. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the panelists to quickly introduce themselves and kind of um, describe where they sit in terms of their thinking around, around cloud generally and obviously PASS specifically. So I'll start with you, Joe. Uh, Joe Weinman, Telex. Um, where I'm sitting is uh, on the leftmost edge of the panel. Nice. Um, Classy. The, uh, I was really, uh, I loved Jonathan's uh, closing comments because one of the things that I never really got about SAS or PASS is the fact that people are, I think, conflating a deployment model with a set of capabilities. And so the notion that things are only available in the cloud as opposed to uh, in a private model to me always seemed an artificial distinction. And uh, I'll I can say more about that if you'd like. I don't know how long you want introductory remarks no, that, to be. That, that's, a, that's a good introduction. So to continue. Uh. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we'll continue. Uh, Dave Casper, UBS. Um, I'm in the uh, group CTO, responsible for strategy on a number of these topics. So happy to participate in this panel. I'm looking forward. Great. Hi, I'm uh, John Treadway with uh, Cloud Technology Partners. We actually work with a lot of clients on uh, past strategies and reference architectures and uh, basically seeing uh, platform as a service 
everywhere we go right now, uh, and it, that's really changed over the course of the last year. It's gotten uh, really front and center in uh, a lot of the conversations we've been having. So, and, the, and our customer clients are large enterprises, so it, it's gotten very interesting. And I think the the comments about from the previous speaker about it being private uh, pass, uh, that's really where we're seeing most of the action. There is work going on in public, but we're seeing a lot of activity, people standing up their own platform as a service. Hi, I'm Dave Zwieback, uh, and I'm the head inf of infrastructure at Newton, and we've actually sort of built two platforms. One is a uh, adaptive learning platform, it's an educational platform, and underneath that, there's a platform on which the adaptive learning platform runs, which is on top of AWS. So that's, that's, where, uh, that's where the experience that I, I'm gonna be talking about comes from. My name's Ken Judy, and I'm a VP of engineering at Simon & Schuster, which is a trade publisher and a CBS company. And I run a small development operations team within the digital group at Simon & Schuster. And I'm basically a customer of cloud platform services, and I am one of necessity. So uh, we'll figure out what my position is on, on how valuable it is. But I wouldn't have anything if I didn't have access to it. Cool. So, so something that um, a, a few people have been writing about and talking about recently is, is, is the commoditization of IT. And more and more, I believe, we're seeing that, that infrastructure is becoming commoditized. And as it does so, people, people move up the stack. Um, we're lucky that, that one of our panelists today is, is kind of the godfather of um, cloud, cloud economics, or cloudonomics as he calls it. In fact, Joe here um, is publishing a book which should be out sometime soon, um, which will be requ required read, reading for everyone. So Joe, I wonder if you, if you can give us a bit of a um, quick, quick talk or quick explanation about where you see the economic drivers for, for PASS. So uh, I guess that's the way to start that out is to talk about the economic drivers of IT in general and then the cloud and then pass, if I can sort of start with that broader brush. And there's this whole view out there that started, I think, with Nick Carr that uh, IT doesn't matter. Um, and the argument in a nutshell, it's well worth delving into it, but his argument is that because IT is quote unquote a commodity, um, anyone has access to it and so therefore it can't be strategic any more than say pork bellies or orange juice can because anyone can buy it. Um, to put it bluntly, I think that completely misses everything that is relevant to IT. Um, and the argument is a little bit like saying because uh, soldiers or steel are commodities, um, therefore no army can possibly win a war. And it fails to explain uh, a very obvious glaring example, namely Google, which has a $200 billion market capitalization um, and $40 billion in revenues annually based on nothing more than IT. Um, they had no brand 10 or 12 years ago, no preferential access to resources. They didn't inherit the only diamond mine, as an example. And yet, they managed to take specific algorithms um, executed via IT uh, to create all of that wealth. So uh, obviously IT can be very strategic and you can ask Borders Books, who competed with Amazon.com, not the AWS obviously, uh, whether or not IT is important. So that said, I also think that cloud computing is strategic. Uh, I did a post for Forbes a couple of weeks ago that lays out this argument in depth. Um, but briefly, there are some important ways in which the cloud can help support uh, company strategy. Um, for example, you can use the Tracy and Wearsome uh, Value Disciplines Framework, which says that um, companies need to excel either at operational excellence, product leadership, or customer intimacy, and the cloud can help with all of those. So operational excellence in terms of helping to not just reduce cost, but increase quality and increase agility or flexibility. Um, and good examples of that are things like uh, package delivery or field support companies that can do optimized routing, uh, optimized truck packing based on uh, computationally intensive bin packing type algorithms and so forth. Uh, in terms of product leadership, obviously things like the iPad, this is a nice device, but it wouldn't be much without cloud-based app stores as well as some of the uh, cloud functions that you can think of, both the endpoint and the cloud as a hybrid. 
Um, so specifically what comes to mind is things like Siri where I can, or search or maps where I can use the computational power in the cloud to complement the power of the endpoint. But moreover, there are a lot of inherently cloud-native applications. And uh, without going into depth on that, an obvious one is social networking. It's very hard to think about having your own private, untethered, disconnected social network, which is just you yourself, right? You inherently need cloud and collaboration. Um, and a third area, namely customer intimacy, things like recommendation engines based on business intelligence and analytics um, are obviously a way of enhancing customer intimacy where a provider knows more about you than you do yourself. All of this is not restricted to IT native companies. Uh, you can consider General Motors with OnStar or uh, Nike with Nike Plus as an example of taking an undifferentiated product, namely a sneaker with a logo on it, and using uh, the cloud, namely Nike Plus's ability to upload routes and your times and create a social network around that as a way of differentiating the product and therefore enhancing competitive advantage. So all that said, strategically, I think one other key thing that is clear today is, uh, and there's a quote that's basically we, we've moved over the last few decades from cheaper uh, to better to faster. Um, and of course, you know, we're in the era of time-based hyper-competition. And so I think that the platform as a service concept, regardless of the deployment model, really ties into corporate strategy um, and competitive strategy in today's world of uh, accelerated hyper-competition because it enables more rapid assembly of components rather than, as Jonathan mentioned, the handcrafting model that lets you take you know, years to kind of think through and design and plan things and evaluate all the different vendors. So, you know, if we're in the era of time-based competition, it's hard to picture anything that is more relevant than being able to leverage platform as a service to be able to accelerate the innovative deployment of new features, you know, besides just, you know, leveraging tested components, um, you know, like billing, credit card validation, identity, et cetera. So I think um, it's definitely a technology for the times. Yeah, you know, cool. Just for reference, just to chime in on that, you know, certainly at UBS. I actually I mean, finished. You don't need to chime in. So, <laughs> but please but, do. Yeah. But okay, so agree with your comment on car. But I think the point though was, if I'm a miller, right, and I got to spend two hours of my day making electricity, maybe I spend two hours back to make killer, you know, bread, and I get ahead. Right, what you just said at, at the end, completely agree. With. We feel the exact same way at UBS, right? The um, I'll, I'll just mix up and steal words. So the, uh, the innovation veloci velocity for us, right, is around taking our talent out of the plumbing, <laughs> right? Uh, this is obvious, this is on the nose, right? And putting them in the right place, right? So that's, that's our particular you know, mix. I imagine it's most of your mix, right, on where craft goes and where industrialization goes, right? So, and th there's actually more topics, but we should. So, so Dave, I mean, you, you, you talk about, and, and I'm assuming uh, the other Dave, sorry. There's two Daves. Yeah. Um, you built your you built your platform yourselves. Keen to hear um, a the, the the drivers for building it yourself, but also your thoughts around this, um, where the value lies, and whether in fact you're going to move away from the infra level as 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 platform becomes an accelerated driver of, of innovation. So, I, remember we have sort of like two two platforms to yeah. talk about, um, and so I completely agree with, with you guys what you're talking about. So. We provide a, a, a recommendation engine, essentially, in the educational content, uh, context. So uh, as you're taking a course online, what should I study next? Obviously, you should study things that uh, you don't already know, that you need help with, and you should not study things that you already know. And so that, fundamentally, this is what our, our adaptive learning platform does. Um, and it accelerates uh, for companies like Pearson and other big publishers whose value is really in the content that they've generated over over a hundred years and that's a very difficult uh, and um, I mean that's the real value of, of any educational company is their content but for them to go from like a printed textbook to online where there's actually you know it's not a PDF it's not a, not a static content that's actually really really difficult and this is where 
like we, we saw this is where the value of Newton is, so uh, as a platform. Um, now, we built our sort of deployment platform or the, the, the thing that runs the adaptive learning uh, platform ourselves out of necessity. We started in the cloud about four years ago when there wasn't really um, a very powerful um, established player uh, of pass. And, you know, I don't know that there's a clear winner, uh, you know, out there now. And I, I would definitely love for, you know, fully sort of integrated Heroku-like solution to be out there that would be also very cost effective. That's, that's the other thing that's also w with the passes at this point. Um, I think they're, they're um, basically, they're, they're costly. So you, as an enterprise customer, your, your biggest, is, your, is, is the biggest barrier or is the biggest demand you have on the vendors that are here the functional issue or, or, or the cost issue, as, you know, the economics for you? Um, I mean, it, it's kind of both because, so, well, it's actually all comes down to cost, really, because if the functional, uh, if the pass, if the passes are not functionally complete, if they're not feature rich, uh, then basically you wind up spending money and time building those things internally, right? Sure. Um, and what experience has have other panelists have in terms of in terms of using pass and the func functional breadth and, and the cost implications? So we, uh, you know, this is interesting because this market is paralleling, but just behind the infrastructure as a service mm -hmm. uh, market. So, uh, you know, six years ago, if you were building a an infrastructure cloud, uh, you really didn't have a lot of options out there. You, you dusted off your enterprise automation tools and crafted it yourself at a cost of a, you know fifteen million dollars plus of R&D, and a lot of people did that, right? Now you can get OpenStack, you can get vCloud Director, you can get uh, cloud.com from Citrix, you can get a, a whole host of technologies to do that for you that are all, you know, starting to mature at a fairly, you know, at a fairly good level, they're actually pretty functional. When they first came out, they were pretty raw, right? Same thing is happening with the platform software market. So the ability for an enterprise starting today to actually get a pretty highly functional platform installed and deployed internally and not have to build it themselves is, is pretty strong. So you know, we have clients that have built their own custom platform as a service that have all of the, a lot of the service layers are not built exactly the same way as a Prenda or as, as a Cloud Foundry or one of the other solutions, but they've got all the capabilities to allow the developers to be uh, very productive, but they had to build it themselves. So now there's a lot more options uh, out there, you know, all the usual suspects, some of them are sponsors of the conference here. And, uh, and that really opens the door. It, it makes it a lot cheaper to get a lot further down the road. You still have to add to it. You can't just take something off the shelf from any of the vendors that are here and say, that's my whole platform. Because I still need a really solid infrastructure base underneath it. I need infrastructure as a service so that I can automate the whole thing end to end, as was pointed out earlier. And I also need, um, a bunch of services that are typically not provided in the past layer uh, products today, like big data services, like vertical services for my business, uh, uh, enterprise service-oriented service, uh, service architecture capabilities that just don't come with those past environments. If you're in the enterprise layer, the, the, the plot pass that you buy is just a very small part of the overall pass environment you actually need to be successful. So it's interesting because that conflicts a little bit with what we heard from Jonathan, where where they are rebuilding their organisation on on pass, and and it seemingly pass ticks all the boxes for them, and and they can build stuff around that. And yet, what we're hearing here is, and 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 I don't disagree with you, is that it's the, it's this little core, but there's a bunch of stuff around that that needs to happen. I just want to make the distinction. There's pass software that you can buy that gets you a part of your platform as a service, but not all of it. And that was the point. Is that what they might have might be a complete environment that's suitable for them, but handles all of the operational things, all the functional things that they need, right? But the out-of-the-box pass solutions have, you know, a tremendous amount of new functionality, but they don't have all of it. So you have to build around that, and that was the point you were making, is that, you know, it only goes a certain level, and I have to put my own things around it. I need a big data cluster here. With, that's not part of my Cloud Foundry, right? I think there's a diagonalization proof that no pass 
offer can ever have all the potentially infinite functionality, right? So right. it's just a matter of no matter how much it has, because IT is such a flexible general purpose technology, there's always going to be stuff by definition that you're going to want to do. So the advantage is, though, that it gives you you know, time to market advantage with tested components rather than building everything a line at a time. When there's always this tension between um, do I want that the absolute most flexible platform that allows me to do anything, or do I want something that's simple and that I can that, can, that I can stand up quickly and and, and, and you know those are conflicting. Yeah. I mean, if I can give an anecdotal example, sure. and, and again, also just a request, right? I know there's some, a lot of supply side out there from something that we would need towards adoption, right? UBS, a Swiss bank, right? Obviously, anyone that was over next door and saw Andy Brown speak, right, knows that we're not going to put a lot of stuff immediately out in public places, but um, you know, some of it is just um, we have policy on the books already that say if it's a non-production environment, you know, you, you can't have customer data on there. We, we, you know, all of us that have grown up as devs know that there's a reason to have customer data or test data. It looks like the real data, so you can actually test, right? Um, and we had a recent, we had a recent, most, most of the we still do it in-house. We had a recent rare case where something had nothing in it. We could do it out of, out, out of house, right, to save some money. Someone had said, hey, why don't you go to Rackspace and get some servers, right? And uh, we we'll say, wait a minute, this is a great opportunity. Then, no, 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 let's just, you know, we'll spin it up in Heroku, right? I mean, Heroku to me makes a whole lot of sense. My personal belief is, is I mean, they're more bullish than, say, the Azure's on the um, forget about servers, right? Which is the right thing to do, right? It's, and to key off of Jonathan's, you know, actually both, both uh, presentations, it's the, if, it, if it is the end of the enterprise uh, application, it's the beginning or the birth of the enterprise workload. I mean, all we care about is workload, right? Cross-jurisdictional workload. So with this, you know, we spin this up and everyone is great. I, I love when these classic moments happen because you can talk all you want about how things are going to change. Um, previously, when we first were doing automation, I was back at another American, large American bank, and I actually had a guy say, well, my job is to compile Apache. What's my, what am I going to do, right? It's like, find another job. You know, a month ago, I had somebody in this team say, well, my job is to be the SA. W what do I do in Heroku? <laughs> find something else to do, right? So it's, it's part of the adoption is getting people to, you know, I mean, it's in a large enterprise, so many people just aren't even thinking this way, which is surprising. I mean, it, it just is the way it is. So you get them to understand what it is. Um, if we had a way, and this is the request of the supply side, if we had a way that said, you know, we can get some kind of data synthesis as a service, right? Because data, data masking, data anonymization, lots of troubles with that if you have to go back and, and, and you know, in a two-way uh, direction. But if it's one way, just to get to peculiarities, like maybe an address has four lines instead of three, some crazy characters, right? Um, if that were available, so we can do take 40% of our kit, which is non-production, put it out in a cheaper, better source place, and then have something like you know, let's say there's a command line Heroku command that says you know promote to prod, and it went into an appliance in-house on-prem. Sure. I mean that would be huge. Again, nothing nothing at all exists like that at all. You know? Yeah, and isn't that kind of, uh, I mean, I'm, again, it goes back to this deployment model notion, and um, one of the examples I think is interesting is Starbucks, okay, not from an IT perspective, but Starbucks started off as a service provider, and at some point they realized that they could take their core product, which is coffee, and rather than delivering it as a service out of their um, coffee centers, or Java centers, I guess we could say, they uh, go ahead. They went ahead and uh, did a distribution deal with Kraft to sell it through retail. Um, it's now a billion dollar business for them. And in the same way, I think uh, back to the earlier points this morning, um, for past providers, uh, rather than just thinking of their business as being wrapped up in a public service delivery model, the notion that you can do private pass, which I know some of you are already doing, is essential. But then to build on your point, the whole thing is that should be completely transparent, right? It's, you know, where do you want to store it? Where do you want to run it? It should just be a matter of clicking rather than being some, you know, whole evaluation decision that requires thousands of staff years to execute. It should just be a button click, and it shouldn't really matter one way or another. It should be based on economic concerns, security, yeah, application Because, because otherwise we take one constrained IT paradigm yeah. and move to another constrained right. IT yeah, paradigm. Exactly. I, left the, I left our PM, our project manager, out of this story too. It wasn't, it, that was, it's like, well, I'm going to get ready, I'm going to get project plans set, I'm going to spin all this up and say we're going to get this going. And I'm like, dude, it's, it's done. We just, it's already done, what do you, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. Ken, interested to hear your experience and what, what's, what's been good, what's been bad, and, and we think vendors need to go to, to deliver on your expectations. Yeah. So like, like I said, um, going to the cloud was not a, 
a strategic decision. It was a pragmatic decision. I work for a company that is a very traditional business. It's the description of Warner Music where it was manufacturing and it's trying to figure out how to be a services provider. That's, that's exactly where Simon & Schuster is. At the point I came into the company, they were in a lights on mode, but they didn't have an alternative strategy. They had just scaled the ability of IT to do anything strategic down to the point where it couldn't do anything strategic. It was just barely keeping the basic systems up. And so I came in with a mandate to support my chief digital officer and build out a whole new suite of consumer offerings experiments. And I had no, no place to do it. <laughs> And so it was one of those things where you have a corporate IT that almost admits that they can't do IT for you. And so the rules are so rigorous that they just let you exist outside of them, which I know every CTO in this room thinks is, is you know, anathema. But we, we, are on, we were for a long time on a private, just like a consumer network because we couldn't get SSH access <laughs> on ports from our, from our corporate network to be able to access our servers. We had no systems op support, so our developers, we have to support the system. So we, we looked for managed, high availability services. We, we were building basically web properties, so Rails platforms made sense for us. And so we found, you know, it was a capital project, so upfront money was not the issue. <laughs> it was, ha you know, staff, no way. So we, we went to the cloud. Um, our experience with that has been, Mixed. I mean, I, I don't think we would basically exist without it. We were able to spin up uh, a project where we had a, you know, basically a, a one staff developer working with an outsourced shop in Chennai of 16 developers. We were able to turn around a whole new consumer offering, a set of websites with, with uh, e-commerce and, and a catalog of all of our books using master data in you know, six months, right, you, for all of our markets. You just can't, you couldn't do that the other way. So we got that up. But, you know, in the meantime, Rails has changed version significantly. Every plugin we started with, or gem, no longer is supported, <laughs> almost. Sure. So this idea that you can just build and plug in and you're done and you move on to the next opportunity is, is crap. Software is software and it ages out. And if you want to continue to use it, and you're, you're dependent on platforms that you don't control, you can't just let it rot. So you, you have to invest in maintaining it. And so, so, so what we're, caught, we're caught in that trap. We don't control necessarily our upgrade path. Sure. We are told your server will no longer be supported unless you change your core Rails platform to this version, which requires yeah. you know, extensive work, right? The, the stuff, again, not to keep calling out Heroku, but what they do on their formal erosion control Mm -hmm. Right, where you're actually good about your contracts, your service contracts. I mean, that's that's where the industry needs to keep staying, right? Right, right. So we we were, we're on Engine Yard, and they're trying to scale to that. Yeah. But they're you know you start with very high support, means that there's a focus on a certain, you know, you got to narrow your options. And it's what the CTO was saying, right? You got to narrow your options in order to provide the, an excellent level of support, where that leaves your customers behind you sometimes. So we've been trying to work that out and figure out. You know, how much can, do we have to invest in stuff we're actually not interested in investing in anymore, but we just kind of want to keep up for a while. You, you bring up actually a pretty interesting point because if you, if you use a piece of software uh, that you can deploy internally and then deploy out to a public cloud and so it's the same pass layer in both places, and then, but you have that software license and you can decide when do I upgrade the underlying platform, right, so that things like your the, the gem services that you're using do continue to work as long as you want them to, right. but you may have to wait a little while before you get the new features, right? So that, that you used to have that control because you controlled which version of WebSphere you were on by just not deploying the new version until you were ready. And when you go to a public pass provider where you're using their software layer, you don't have that control anymore. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's a challenge, that's actually kind of See, it's kind of bad if, behavior. If, yeah. if the issues you had are, are, are a factor of this is young, it's immature, and we're not really there, or whether it's actually a disconnect between the story about you can forget about everything, you can forget about your servers, oh, but we actually forgot to tell you that you can't forget about what version of Rails you're using or whatever. You know, is, is it a, and I, I suspect that's a little bit of disconnect there because mm -hmm. we're, we're promising this, or um, platform as a service generally is promising this aspirational vision of you know, it's it's all over. You know, this this is this is the holy grail. Your 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 stresses have gone, 
but the reality is that there's still stuff to think about, and I just wonder. See, if, if the paradigm changes, it doesn't, that's not an excuse to not have good quality architecting and good quality engineering, right? I mean, the classic example of that was, you know, every year ago when AWS, one of the regions went down, and half the new startups, right, who had just won, thank you, half the, they had just won them, right? It was like, oh, cloud is horrible, it's not ready, it's not this, but I mean, Netflix, right, had good, solid arc architecture, right? Basic 101 stuff, and they didn't go down. Same thing with, um, with PaaS, as we're integrating stuff. I mean, w one of the hallmarks of good architecting is, over time, seeing how fluid your API contracts are, right? I mean, if you're a bunch of just engineers and devs, right, you're gonna have really, really fluid APIs and have all this kind of problem, right? I mean, your architects are supposed to really, really be thinking about this stuff, right? It's not easy to do, it's not an easy field. And you keep your, you know, your fluidity of your APIs down, and this helps us as we start having this, you know, pie in the sky world of stuff together, right? So, so are we looking for more maturity in terms of how our PaaS providers message to us? in terms of what's actually required, you know, what you can forget and what you can't? I mean, is it, is it a messaging thing, is it a communication thing, or is it it's a on, It's thing? on supply and demand side. I mean, both, mm -hmm. the products seem to be, you know, really, really quality architected, even if it's a different paradigm. And same thing on the consuming side, right? We, we can't just use something, right, right, without good architecture, right? So it's interesting. You do have to understand, though, I mean, this is, it's been brought up several times. We're really at the beginning of this yeah. market. If you're gonna jump into this, be willing to take some, you know, you're, you're, by definition, you're taking some risks, mm -hmm. right? You're starting with new stuff in a new way, and quite frankly, it, the model hasn't, you know, shook out yet. Even the infrastructure as a service model hasn't shook out yet. All the security models and, you know, client isolation, all that kind of stuff is still being discussed and debated and talked about. And so, we're still very early, so just, you know, understand that, bake into your assessment and your, uh, your, your estimates of what you're gonna be doing. The fact is, is that the platform's gonna change mm -hmm. and you may have more work to do as a result of that. That will detract, that will take away some of the productivity gains you're getting by using a platform. I don't think it's gonna take away enough of them to not do it, but bake it in. Don't just assume it's all gonna be la la and wonderland, because it's not. It was interesting because we heard Sinclair from Apprenda say that 2012 or 2013 is going to be the breakout year for PaaS. I mean, maybe it's my um, antipathy and conservatism, but um, I, I don't see that happening because, you know, when we've got, you know, um, large important organisations that are having simple issues that are actually really important, it, it indicates a, a lack of maturity. So I kind of wonder where we all think this is actually going and, and you know, the organisations here, how much stuff are you actually comfortable doing on pass, and, and, and at what point do you think it'll be mature enough to, to, to do more? I can certainly say at UBS we're completely, completely bullish strong on pass, even if it's internal. It's an operating model, right? It's not, I go out and buy PaaS, it's sure. an operating model, and that's what we're probably gonna see breaking out. Okay. It, you know. I think we're still in the early stages, um, because um, I think maybe it was Mike that alluded to some of this. Uh, the expression was something like, we're going to enjoy a cornucopia of components. And um, you know, what comes to mind is the uh, App Store model and the hundreds of thousands of apps that are available, uh, you know, obviously for Apple and increasingly uh, for Android as well and uh, other contenders, let's say. Um, and so what's really interesting is this notion of um, unleashing a uh, profitable aftermarket of third-party developers that can develop components. And you know, to me, the number of plugins that are available for many of the platforms is still relatively small compared to the possibility. So I think we're still in the early stages of what can happen in terms of creating an ecosystem of uh, industrialized uh, IT that is sort of democratized, not so much down to the consumer, but for many developers to kind of achieve their own uh, American dream, as it were, in terms of being able to create some useful piece of functionality um, and offer it for sale in a micropayments model. So, uh, you know, still a lot to come, but the, the model is obviously proven in every other industry, right? You've got you know, plenty of components in the world of industry where you can buy screws and fans and conveyor belts from, you know, dozens of different suppliers. So 
I don't see why the same thing won't happen even more so in the software business. Uh, Joe, it's never going to get that commoditized. It's never going to get that standardized. Um, you know, you have to have the same size machine screw for everybody, and you have to have tested it because there are building standards and you regulations. Know, there can be dozens of credit card cloud, validation tools happen. or yeah. thousands of people doing algorithms for, I don't know, graphics animation or whatever. I think you're going to find... Uh, to use one of James' favorite expressions, the Cambrian explosion uh, beginning for this. So, you know, it's funny because, so I spent a lot of time on Wall Street and in, in the pharmaceutical uh, industry, and so th these are the guys with, with, with the really huge amounts of data that's sensitive and regulated and all that stuff, right? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm surprised it kind of came up, you know, with the, with the UBS, uh, scenario where as long as there's no real data on it, you could put it in the cloud. Well, that, that was meant for a point because because of being a Swiss bank, obviously, you know, we're not putting any primetime main stuff mm. out there, but it was trying to jumpstart something that we believe in wherever you could do it. So, so, so a methodology I, rather than the Exactly, and, and just get, 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 get people yeah. understanding that. And again, to the point I made earlier, most of our, you know, growth in 2013 will be internal, mm -hmm. following a past operating model internally. So, so I kind of feel like, uh, maybe it's a little controversial, but uh, I mean, definitely security in the cloud is not where it needs to be. But uh, if, if I were trying to um, penetrate or attack UBS, get UBS's data, would I uh, scan you know, 1.7 million AWS IP addresses and hope I find an open port? Or would I try to go to you know, well, the well, there's no data. No, no data was put there. Well, that, you wouldn't so even find the word. You wouldn't even find the letters U, B, and S anywhere in there. Well, so what I mean, like, if, so if I if I were after UBS's data, I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't mean to pick on UBS yeah. by the way, right? Yeah. <laughs> I would I would go in. I would try to you know get in physically into that data center through some you know some means, right? Uh, social engineering or some some other way, right? Um, I think actually in some way the data is actually safer in the cloud, uh, and which is not to say that. You should just sort of like leave I it mean, out that, in that, the open. That, that's a general data kind of security cloud question. Yeah. So, and, and I mean, that's a recurring theme. You know, we, we did it through infrastructure and software as a service, and, and now we're kind of doing it on pass. Exactly. It's, it's, it's My own, one, another supply side request is if, if even at the pass layer, if people, if suppliers could do the same thing that Amazon and, and Google did with getting, you know, DSS PCI compliant and getting, you know, FISMA, right? That, that saves us a huge amount of internal discussions with risk and, you know, and, and, and insecurity who may or may not get the topics at all, right? right? So those are smart moves by at the infrastructure as a service layer. Seeing more of that at the platform as a service layer would be helpful. Yeah. So I, I, I'll yeah, be I, in my experience, uh, it comes to that just doing good engineering. If you're working with a platform, you get to focus on the things that are actually important better than if you're trying to build everything from scratch. So when CBS does come back and wants to now understand our security levels and audit our systems. Our systems meet their requirements because we had time to make sure that passwords are encrypted and all of that. We didn't have to focus on getting, figuring out how to connect an object to a database, right? That stuff was all solved for us. Yeah, we, we've been building uh, on top of that. I mean, you think about governance and the development process. Not all apps will run on, you know, the platform you have. You might have a Java platform, but your application won't run on it because it's got all sorts of code in there that's very dependent on WebSphere or WebLogic or Oracle or something out there. And so we've actually had for, we've had to build for our clients tools that actually will analyze their source code and find all the rules violations for that, will it run there? And some of them are security, but a lot of them are just kind of coding standards and things relate to what we call cloud principles. And we actually, you know, run source code through there and we find, well, you know, to move this app over here, it sounds really great because it's a Java app, it'll run on your Java pass. Well, no, it won't, not without 727 days of development effort, right? It's a lot of work. And so people miss, a, you know, it's a .NET pass. I can take all my .NET applications and run them. Well, you can, but unless you've got, you know, if you've got some things that you're doing in your application that are not really .NET, which a lot of developers have put in, then, you know, it's gonna take effort. So. It, it, there's just mm -hmm. so many things that you got to think about here about how you deploy it at production scale, but also how your applications are going to run on it. Uh, that uh, you know, it, ta it takes some thinking. It's not just hey, turn on pass and I'm ready to go. Isn't that a lot of the drive for internal cloud is private cloud? Is that 
it, it's a shortcut in the thinking of what you actually have to do to make your system secure because then you, you say, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> this system doesn't matter because I mean, it's all within this yeah. protected. Yeah, I mean, these, sure are, these are issues that are going to come up in, in, in panels later on. We're, we're just about out of, out of time, but we've probably got time for one quick question, and there's a keen hand in the back there. Just shout. Uh, good question. Um, I guess to my mind, there's sort of uh, separable notions, right, in the sense that, uh, you know, data gravity, there's no question about that. The whole notion that um, it's easier to move the applications to where the data is than to move the data to where the applications are. So, but to me, it's there are orthogonal issues, unless there's a subtlety I'm missing. So, in other words, how you code your applications, whether you do it line at a time or on a componentized basis, they're still going to be, you know, swept up by data gravity orbits. Sure. We're right out, out of time. I want to thank all our panelists. It's been really interesting. Um, and maybe use what they've said as we go through the day and, and reflect upon it. Thanks.